These presentations take place quarterly and are open to anyone in the horse industry. The intent is to increase information sharing within the horse industry in Canada on all topics related to equine health and welfare. Please note that the presentation is recorded and will be posted on EC's eCampus along with previous calls. We will welcome questions at the end of the presentations as the questions are not recorded. We have muted all lines to avoid background noise. If you wish to unmute to ask a question at the end of the call, please press the unmute button on your screen. We have three speakers today. Our first speaker is Dr. Amy Greer, who is an infectious disease epidemiologist and mathematical modeler in the Department of Population Medicine at the Ontario Veterinary College. She co-leads the Equine Network Epidemiology and Biosecurity Research Team with her colleague, Dr. Terry O'Sullivan. Dr. Greer, are you ready to start your presentation? Sure thing. Um, I will, let's see if I can share. Oh, yeah, there we go. Christy has given me the sharing ability, so that's good. Okay, so I'm just going to rearrange my windows here a little bit. I feel as though when I give talks like this, it's always, it's like I can only see my slides and myself, which is not that uh, exciting. So I'll try to rearrange it so I can see some of you at least. Um, so uh, thank you to, to Christy for the invitation. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is an overview of some work that we presented to Equestrian Canada um, earlier this year. Um, and it was uh, work that, that my colleague, Dr. Terry O'Sullivan and myself have been um, co-leading out of OVC uh, along with our postdoc, Dr. Tanya Rossi. And really what this is, is it's a starting point. And I think you're going to see um, why it's a starting point to a much larger um, project, which is to try to develop some computer simulations to allow us to use computer simulations and build some tools that allow us to look at, at the impact of different biosecurity measures um, in different kind of um, scenarios. So really kind of scenario planning tools that we can use to try to examine the impact of different types of biosecurity measures. But there's a key piece of information that we needed first to be able to do that. And, and that is what this data is that I'm going to talk to you about today. So when we talk about networks, what we're really talking about is relationships that occur between individuals within a population. And so, you know, you can imagine if you look at this um, picture on the bottom where we have the horse kind of icons with lines connecting them. When we talk about networks, what we're really talking about are networks that would facilitate the potential for disease transmission. And for many pathogens, especially pathogens that are directly transmitted from horse to horse contact, um, what these networks represent are potential contacts that occur, horses that have contact with one another. And so when we talk about networks, we talk about these sorts of diagrams, who has contact with whom and in what period of time, because that's really important for our ability to be able to understand the risk that might exist given a specific network structure, should we see the introduction and subsequent spread of a pathogen within that network. And this is the part where, where it's really important because we understand, um, for instance, things about the epidemiology of different equine pathogens. So, you know, whether we're talking about equine herpes virus or equine influenza or strangles, there are lots of different pathogens and, and clinically we know a lot about many of those pathogens. And then we also know things about the disease dynamics. So we know the way in which those pathogens are most commonly transmitted. Is it through direct horse to horse contact? Can the pathogen be spread through the sharing of equipment or spread through in contaminated environmental surfaces? So we know a lot about those pieces. But when we want to talk about doing some sort of risk assessment in terms of what the potential would be for actual transmission to occur and how we might intervene to change that, um, what we need to know is we need to know something about networks because networks are what bring the two things together. It tells us something about the way in which the industry or the way in which our um, situation brings animals together in different 
patterns. And if we can understand those patterns, it can help us to understand risk for disease spread. And so you can imagine if I show you these two different little cartoons, that if depending on the type of network structure you have, the risk within the population could be quite different. So if you look on the left hand side, we have these horses, and it's the same number of horses, but only small numbers of them are connected, right? So have direct contact in this example. We have a lot of singletons, so animals that are not connected to other animals. And you can imagine that if I took a horse that had um, an infection of some sort that's transmitted by direct transmission, if I dropped it into that network on the left, you know, if I, if I drop it in and it's one of these singletons, that horse doesn't have an opportunity to spread to anybody else because it doesn't have contact with anybody else. If I were to drop it into this group here where we have three horses that are connected, at most, even if, even if everybody became infected, the largest possible outbreak size you could have would be three because th those are, are kind of clustered off together. The implications of dropping an infected horse into the network on the right would be quite different. All of these horses are connected to one another in this example. And if we assume that those connections represent uh, you know, direct horse contact, you could imagine how if one of these horses were infected with a, with a pathogen, that spread could occur uh, and, and your maximum outbreak size could in fact be quite a bit larger. Um, and so while we recognize that equine outbreaks are rare events, um, certainly you know, the probability of a large outbreak is, is, is quite low, they are what I would call high consequence events. And so from a preparedness and planning perspective, we really want to use the precautionary principle and plan for even things that might be more rare because of the high consequence. And we've seen this, certainly we've seen this um, with the equine herpes uh, virus that was associated with the cutting horse show in, in 2011 where we ended up with you know, 242, I think there were 421 horses on site at the show. It ended in a multi-state outbreak that had spread into, into Northern Canada, uh, into Western Canada, 242 premises exposed, 162 cases, very large outbreak um, with significant impact, impact um, to the industry that spread very widely as you know, was associated with um, you know, cancellation of events, so also very disruptive. And also, you know, the 2007 equine influenza outbreak in Australia, where, you know, the, the economic impacts that included both direct and indirect um, estimates were, you know, over 700 million Australian dollars when you take into account, um, you know, what happens when you shut down racing, when you implement movement restrictions, all of those sorts of things you know, economically really challenging um, in terms of, of industry, very disruptive um, and really bad for, for horse health and, and welfare, certainly. So what we did to try to understand, you know, what does the, what does the network of Equestrian Canada sanctioned shows look like? Um, and so we had a data set um, from EC that ranged from 2016 to 2018. And so this included um, 6,512 um, shows and we excluded shows outside of Ontario. So this is kind of a proof of concept. We, we have talked about um, doing this nationally, but what we focused on uh, as a first pass is just um, sanctioned shows in the province of Ontario. What we can see is that, um, you know, we have a bit of variability here in terms of the number of shows that were um, sanctioned across those years. And then because there are entries that, um, because there are shows where there are no entry data, we have to exclude those because we don't know which horses attended um, those events. And so once we kind of <coughs> take care of, of some of the data wrangling, we end up with, you know, between 153 and 160 shows um, in each of those years. So if you think about this, what we're really talking about is we can, we can organize that network in different ways. So one way we can organize it is we can think about the nodes or the, you know, the dots in those graphs as competitions. Instead of having individual horses with lines between them, we can have competitions as the node and edges or lines between them representing um, individual horses that attended multiple competitions. 
So what connects the different competitions is that they share horses in common. And what we actually um, found, which you know is really probably not that surprising, and for many of you, um, some of this will not be surprising, but it's always nice to be able to back up our intuition with an analysis of the data to understand you know, whether or not our intuition is, is correct. So what we found was that endurance and reigning shows were isolates. They actually did not connect into any of the other shows. Um, and that means spread between, you know, potential disease spread between horses participating in these events would not occur at the competition level. But what we don't know is, and, and this is important, is that this is just looking at um, EC sanctioned events. So it doesn't tell us anything about what sorts of horses competing horses might have contact with at their home facilities. So right now we are not including information about the home facilities, which is important, um, an important limitation that we should mention. What we did find was that hunter jumper dressage and eventing are all connected um, together in one large group. Um, and that means that if you were to have the introduction of a pathogen into competitions of any of those three types, they are connected because horses move between those different um, types of events. The shows clearly cluster out by discipline. Um, shows of the same discipline were more densely interconnected um, than shows of different disciplines. Um, but it's important to recognize that they are all connected in some way. So although you have, you know, most of the hunter jumper shows cluster together, most of those horses only go to other hunter jumper shows you do have crossover between the different disciplines, which means um, that you know you have to plan for that in terms of, of preparedness and, and response around biosecurity should you have a, an issue. You know, there are a couple of really interesting things, right? Is that the eventing networks um, had the densest connections and had the highest number of horse contacts, but behaviorally, there are a lot of things that happen um, associated with eventing that are that are likely protective, right? They primarily compete outside, they primarily trailer in and out, horse to horse contact in this sort of environment is likely um, less than you might see in other types of settings. Again, platinum networks had very high density of connections, um, lots of horses uh, competing at this level, but again, very high level of biosecurity, highly motivated owners uh, in terms of, of adhering to, to biosecurity protocols. Now, this is the one that, that most people I think will find um, surprising is that when we look at the horses, we just take all of the Equestrian Canada horses that competed in each of these years, what do the horse networks look like? So each, column in this table is a year. So 2016, 2017, 2018. So the first line here is nodes. This is the, the number of individual horses in each of these networks. So you know, you're looking at about 4,000 horses in the province of Ontario that are competing in equestrian Canada sanctioned events. Some of these horses might compete in one event over the course of the year. Some of them may compete in many, many events. And that's why this number underneath is really important. This is about 4,000 horses and over a million distinct connections. So we consider a connection to be horses that attend the same show. So if you are in co-attendance with other horses at an event, then, then we assume that you likely have had some sort of contact. And that's, and that's an assumption, which is likely an overestimate, but as a starting pass, that's kind of the, the assumption. So we're looking at over a million distinct contacts. The other important thing here is that the degree of separation between any un, between unconnected horses was two other horses, which is actually not. It means the chain, you know, the the amount of connection is actually quite close. Um, and the other thing is what we call median degree. So this is the average number of horses um, that that would be encountered by a horse in this network. The average is, you know, over 500 over the course of a season. And some horses um, were connected to over 2000 horses over the course of a season as a result of co-attendance at shows. So the range varies certainly, you know, at the lower end here, we're talking, you know, in the 100s, 191 in 2018 was the lower bound here. Um, 
But on average, you know, lots and lots of potential for contact to occur. These horses are, are moving a lot, they're attending a lot of shows, um, and they have contact with a lot of different individuals. <clears throat> what we found was that horses that competed at both gold and silver shows had the highest number of contacts compared to, the, to all the other horses in the network. Um, and certainly hunter jumper um, horses had the highest average number of, of distinct contacts. It's also really important for us to think about the fact that some horses um, serve as bridges between otherwise unconnected groups. And so if you think back to that picture I showed you originally, we had kind of clusters of, of horses, is that it's really important to be able to identify if there are certain types of horses that bridge different groups because those bridges create opportunities for transmission to potentially occur from kind of one group of horses to another. And if we can identify characteristics of horses that often serve as bridges, then you can better target biosecurity towards horses that would be what we would consider higher risk for, for transmitting. Um, and horses competing in multiple disciplines at multiple levels, and there were a lot of horses that fell into this category actually, um, were the most likely to bridge uh, different distinct groups. And Tanya has called Tanya has called this um, popular neighbors, which is that you know even if an individual horse doesn't have a lot of contact, um, because the horses are are um, connected uh, indirectly through only a small number of other horses, having a popular you know many of the horses they may contact might have a very popular neighbor who has a really high contact number, and so that's really important. Um, to consider and horses that competed in gold and silver hunter jumper were most likely to have neighbors in the network who had very high contact numbers. The other um, thing is that we also created venue networks right because we know that that shows you know shows are, are one unit. Um, but in fact, within the province of Ontario, we have a, a far uh, smaller number of venues that are hosting all of those shows, right? There's a lot of shows, 150, let's say, um, over the course of the season, but those aren't hosted at 150 unique venues, in fact. So if you look at venues, it turns out um, that, that only endurance venues were unconnected, um, that raining gets pulled into this big ball of spaghetti network as soon as we start thinking about networks based on venues, because those events occur at venues that are hosting all of these other types of events. Which really, um, you know, again, suggests that connection through shared venues is important because it means we really need to focus on things like disinfection, cleaning before, you know, as, as individuals leave the facility before we bring new animals in, in terms of, of some of those biosecurity cautions. And certainly, you know, not unsurprising, um, a small number of very large ven venues are responsible for the majority of horse movements, right, are really hosting the, the vast majority of, um, of events uh, compared to small venues who just host one or two per year. And again, if we look at the number of venues, you know, it sits between 56 and 63, depending on the year. But if we look at, and in, in kind of network science, we call this the giant strong component, which is kind of a very strange name for just saying, you know, how connected are they? Um, and it turns out that if you look at the whole season, um, almost every venue is connected with every other venue because of the fact that animals are moving so frequently. Now recognizing that that's not really a perfect um, way to describe risk, right? Because we know that, you know, if you are at a venue in May, let's say, um, you know, you're, you're encountering probably because, you know, if you don't go back to that same venue until September, there's been a really long period of time that, that has passed, right? And so what we looked at was we looked at the venue networks by month, broken down by month. And again, not unsurprisingly, May to August networks really show the highest potential for risk um, because you have so many more um, venues and, and shows in the mix, so many more horses participating, um, which is not unsurprising. 
So, you know, we've, we've started this process now that we have the networks and, you know, in a perfect world, I would have loved to show you the networks. Um, but to be honest, the networks themselves, like the picture where you have all the horses connected with lines, the picture is so, everybody is so connected that it's just like a giant ball of spaghetti and makes it impossible to really see anything, especially um, nice. So we haven't put up those um, pictures, uh, but just to say that the reason is, is that the network is really, really densely connected. And so, you know, this suggests that the potential exists. And like I said, we're talking about um, low probability, but high consequence events. Um, the Equestrian Canada network is what we call a small world network. It has network characteristics um, that in kind of um, disease transmission circles, if you're a scientist, we call a small world network, which means that the path between any two horses is very short. And what that means is if you drop an infected animal in, the potential for spread before you identify you have a problem is quite significant. And so, you know, using that as a planning assumption to do scenario planning moving forward is a really um, good way for us to better understand what that looks like. Certainly, um, current guidelines around vaccination and biosecurity protocols, those are things that we continue to focus on. We know from, from a lot of survey data that we've done that, that owners are very willing and interested um, in, in contributing and in um, learning about best practices around biosecurity to, to keep their horses healthy. Um, and you know, moving forward, the idea of, of venue cooperation to really identify um, how we can maximize biosecurity. Um, and again, thinking about emergency preparedness, you know, it's always best to plan for the worst case scenario and hope that you don't find yourself in that situation um, and having an understanding of what those networks look like um, give us a lot of ability to, to do some next steps to help us better understand those sorts of things. So on that note, I will um, sign off and I'm not sure, I think Christy said, are we doing questions at the end or? Yes, we'd like to save questions to the end if okay, you have perfect just to stay on, Dr. Greer. Yep. Thank you, thank you so much for that. That that is such valuable work in in terms of emergency preparedness, and quite frankly, it couldn't be more timely. We're obviously all hypersensitized to the concept of infectious disease pandemics and and uh, the development of of this sort of background work is essential. And the other reason, of course, it's very timely is a situation, the rapidly changing situation we're seeing with uh, equine herpes virus. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, the, the cutting horse scenario because that was recent enough that many of us will remember, remember how that uh, panned out ultimately. Um, our next speaker, speaker is Dr. Allison Moore from OMAFRA, who is going to help us understand what is going on with herpes virus as of, I guess, today. Um, uh, Dr. Moore, are you available? Yep, I'm here. Um, Thank you. So, so hi, thanks, Bettina. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, and a great talk, Amy, as usual. This stuff is very fascinating, I find. Um, and I think it will certainly inform uh, organizers of shows and in, in helping them to have some degree of incident management for, for disease, for sure. Um, so just on what's going on, I'll speak primarily of Ontario and then maybe a bit more generally. So in Ontario, fortunately, we still just have the three facil facilities that are dealing with um, equine herpes, myeloencephalopathy, so that's the neurological form of herpes. We have, um, we're actually getting to the end of the animal, voluntary animal movement restrictions, but I'm not going to say when because I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> I think it's coming up soon. Um, I often get, so I, just on that, when, when we go into uh, or get involved in a uh, equine herpes situation from OMAFRA's perspective, usually what happens in, in Ontario, we have the Animal Health Act and EHV1 is immediately notifiable disease. So it's notifiable by the lab Stories. Now, often a veterinarian will give me a heads up if they think they have a case. So, but we always, we wait for confirmation through the lab and then I get in contact with the veterinarian and we discuss, uh, so, so some of the things we discuss right away are um, the state of, of the horse that's been affected, um, the contacts with that horse, 
if there was a new horse, because typically I find in, in our neuro outbreaks due to EHV1, um, when, there's, when there's more than one case, usually there's been a new horse on the property within the last two weeks. That seems uh, almost invariable. Now, in other situations where there's just a single horse affected neurologically, and it tends to be in Ontario, the, the non-neuropathogenic strain, and I'll get to the strains in a minute, those horses, often there has not been a new, new horse on the property recently. And, and we think those horse, horses recrudesce. So if you remember about herpes, the, um, the challenging part with this virus is that it stays uh, latent within the horse. So most horses are affected, or 70% is, is the going number of horses are affected when they're born to early, early month of life. And the virus will then stay in the horse. And I always liken it to chicken pox. So when chicken, kids have chicken pox and they, they overcome, the virus is still within their system and it can come out later in life as shingles. So with horses, the EHV1 virus is in them. It can come out at any point um, and they can start shedding doesn't mean um, they will be sick and often we believe the ones that start shedding aren't the ones that get sick they transmit that virus then to horses nearby and then it's around 10 percent of horses that become infected with the ehv1 that may develop neurologic disease but it's more complex than that because it's an individual situation with the immune system of that horse um, when a horse does develop neurologic signs, they shed a lot more virus than a horse that doesn't have neurologic signs. So that's also one of the things that we discuss when there's a case of a, a horse that's suffering for neurologic diseases, can, um, can you get it off the property? Can you get it to a hospital with an isolation facility or at, at a very minimum, can you isolate it? Because that will start to contain that viral spread. Um, in terms of biosecurity, the, uh, the, the, the sort of standard biosecurity procedures are isolation of sick horses when possible. And that's another challenge is many of these farms don't have extra space. So we have to discuss how we're going to manage those ho horses on farm. Um, and in, in some cases in the past, we've used what are called barrier precautions in which we manage that horse in the stall because there is nowhere else to put it. Uh, um, we, uh, the uh, veterinarian works with the facility owner, putting basically a barrier around that stall door, making sure there's a foot bath, hand sanitizer, gloves, and coveralls outside that door and a garbage bag for um, anything to be discarded. And they sort of clothe up before they go in and they clothe down when they come out. And anything that goes in that stall is disinfected. It's done last. We use terms called uh, um, clean to dirty. So horses that are unaffected and away from the affected horse are mucked and fed, um, watered first, and then you progress to the, the more affected uh, horses. So those are our standard procedures. We have um, the virus. It, it's not a particularly hardy virus, contrary to what I'm, I've been hearing uh, rumors around on, on social media. So it can last around 48 hours. The cold actually inhibits, inhibits it more. Um, it's an envelope virus, meaning it succumbs to disinfectants fairly well, and it, it, it doesn't last long on um, wood shavings is one. They think it disrupts the envelope of the virus. So you have a horse on wood shavings, it would last less, less long than a horse on shavings, et cetera. But we try not to get into the, that kind of nitty gritty details because we want people really just to focus on, on cleaning and disinfecting, not so much is it going to last longer on this surface versus that. Ideally with stalls, we want a, a cleanable surface. So the, um, the porous wood is a bit of a challenge, but you know, we all have to work with those in our, in our barn environments. And uh, over time, and certainly it can be cleaned and disinfected without, without issues. Um, the other thing I would say about this fire, so just briefly on vaccination, because that's another common question I get. Um, do we vaccinate in the face of an outbreak? Uh, I don't recommend that, and there's a few reasons. So again, it's a case by case, but on most situations, there's only one barn, maybe two. And the affected horse usually has contact in both barns often. So we don't do vaccination anywhere near the affected horse because we don't know who's been exposed. And part of the reason is vaccines will often, um, particularly the ones for influenza and the HV14, which are come in a combo, 
often, um, will stimulate an immune response. That's the point of it. But we don't know uh, if it will create more inflammation in that horse. And that type of inflammatory immune response can make that, may make that horse more prone to developing neurologic signs. So that's one reason we avoid it. The other reason is it can complicate your, the uh, animal movement restrictions because another big piece of the biosecurity is having um, the facility manager and staff monitor the, those horses' uh, temperatures twice a day. And when a fever is detected, if there's room, that horse is moved to an isolation. And again, it resets the 21-day animal movement restrictions from that day of fever. So we don't want to complicate that by vaccinating and imposing fevers that often come into effect when you vaccinate horses. It's not unusual to get a mild fever. So we uh, avoid that. Now, if you had a large facility and you had uh, perimeter barns that really had no contact with the affected horse, yes, you could vaccinate those because here's what the vaccines will do. And, and this is another um, uh, misunderstanding. So there's there's two strains of the virus. There's the neuropathic and the non-neuropathic strain. They're very poorly named because both of them cause neurologic disease. It was once thought that the neuropathic strain was more likely to cause an outbreak of neuro disease and the non-neuropathic strain less likely. However, in some states in the US, uh, the non-neuropathic strain has caused more outbreaks than the neuropathic strain. And that's why we don't report the strains anymore because it's just too confusing for people. The vaccines that are available um, for EHV1 are effective against both strains. The, the issue is they don't protect against the neurologic, the development of neurologic disease. And there's a lot more complicated um, uh, pathogenesis to the development of neurologic disease. But what the vaccines do do, decrease shedding if they get exposed to the virus, um, and they lessen the, the severity of sickness in terms of respiratory disease. So those are two excellent reasons to vaccinate. And certainly every show horse should be vaccinated um, for herpes virus, but not more than twice a year. And it's interesting that Amy mentioned uh, fin, um, uh, well, it was Ogden, Ohio, but there was, a, there was an outbreak in Finley, Ohio years before that, where there was a, a large number of horses at a riding school developed neurologic disease. And they were been vaccinated every two months um, and they, that was one of the precipitating causes um, the scientists felt for the, cause, for the development of neurologic disease in these horses was a very frequent vaccination. And at the time, that's what we were recommending was every two to three months with that particular vaccine. The vaccines have progressed and now um, it's once to twice a year, depending on your risk. Show horses are a little higher risk because of what Dr. Greer just said, all the contacts. So we do recommend twice a year, six months apart. So it is a good idea to have your horses vaccinated. Um, the other question that I get uh, is, is there more of it around this year? Well, that's a really hard question to answer because the only way we know about it is if people test, test for it. And so there's probably a number of cases where people don't test. Um, so we don't really know about it. And there's an increased awareness. So it's a bit of a bias. In Ontario, I don't feel like it's any worse this year than it's been in the past, well, touch wood. Um, but th that, is my, that is my sense right now. The other thing I wanted to mention too, um, as many of you know, herpes virus can cause a variety of different diseases uh, from respiratory disease to abortion to neurologic disease. And so I would just um, try and impress upon people that have or, or decide to breed their mares that you keep them separate from your riding horses at your facility because if you have brood mares long enough you will deal with an abortion due to herpes virus and often the virus that causes the abortion you know, well it could be um it could be a neurologic, uh, neuro, neuropathogenic strain. And again, like I said, it doesn't really matter which strain. It can cause neurologic disease in other horses. So uh, it, when you have a mare that aborts, there's a 21-day movement restriction usually on that facility. So if you have show horses, you're stuck in that movement restriction. Plus, there's the added risk, more importantly, to your horse's health um, from a, a mare that is now shedding virus because when they expel the fetus in an abortion, all of that fluids that come out with the fetus, high, high viral load. Some of these mares have shed from, they'll continue to shed from the nose and some of them will shed for up to two, three months. So it's just something you have to think, you have 
to start thinking ahead for um, how you're going to manage manage these horses and in thinking about biosecurity disease if I have a disease on my farm where am I going to put these horses do I have a quarantine barn um, how can I manage my facility so I have some empty stalls somewhere if so if I need to use them and then avoid putting brood mares near uh, your uh, riding horses or your non-reproductive horses and I, I think that's all I had to say. Excellent, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, also very timely with respect to people starting to plan their spring vaccines and a, a really good reminder of all of the reasons how and why we vaccinate. And that was a really good review of the confusing world of uh, equine herpes viruses. Our, our final speaker uh, this morning is Dr. Wayne Burwash. Uh, Wayne is going to talk to us about infectious disease as well. Um, Wayne is a practitioner from Alberta, mostly retired now, but still retains a strong interest in horse reproduction. And Wayne has been tackling um, uh, a regulatory miscommunication that's been lingering for a couple of years that has made importation of semen from the US particularly challenging. And he has discovered a way around the problem. So with that, uh, Dr. Burwash, uh, please uh, go ahead and tell us what you've learned. <laughs> well, th thanks, Bettina, and hi, everybody. I'm not sure if I found a real positive solution, but uh, anyhow, the uh, really switching gears here on um, away from maybe infectious disease in a sense, but um, I, I want to make this announcement, uh, and Equestrian Canada has been working on this, and I've been the lead person. Uh, and uh, of course, what we found is a real problem with the awareness uh, in the process of getting the export papers or import papers, whatever side of the border you're on, completed on shipping cooled uh, horse semen from the US. And so, um, and this also applies to frozen semen, but of course the timeline on frozen semen isn't really a, a factor usually. And therefore uh, I've been focused mostly on the process of uh, shipping cooled equine semen from the US into Canada. And so um, the, uh, the, the basic premise or the basic regulation that we need to comply with is the requirement of uh, CFIA through the USDA of uh, having a health certificate uh, completed after the semen is collected and processed. And, uh, and then uh, the other main requirement that creates a bit of a problem is the need for a paper copy or a hard copy at the point of entry in Canada. Uh, at the border, usually at the uh, FedEx office or, or uh, wherever it's coming into, but mostly international airports uh, at the FedEx office where there's uh, CFIA um, officials. So, so um, the process uh, until, well, 19, or sorry, uh, uh, 2018 or maybe 19, anyhow, the last two to three years, have changed where there's uh, a new process. But up to that point, the accredited veterinarians on the farms in the US were required to fill the paperwork out on the farm after they collected the semen, then present a hard copy in person to the USDA office, uh, however far away it might be, and it could be you know, up to 100 miles or more away. And so this required uh, um, often a, a courier or somebody to transport that. And so you've got the two problems there, the time involved in transporting it, as well as the, uh, the cost of the courier to present uh, or to take that hard copy all that distance and present it to the USDA office. So. These were two huge impairments to shipping semen uh, from the US into Canada and the access for Canadian breeders to uh, the um, uh, bloodlines and that in the States. So, um, so, 
you know, once uh, the hard copy got to the USDA, there was two options from there. Uh, if the time was allowed, the papers would come back to the farm and then travel with the semen, uh, which usually is overnight by FedEx. Uh, the other way with the old method is to fax the papers from the USDA office to the importers in Canada and the point of entry in Canada. So um, anyhow, all this took time. So now by far the preferred method that has been in place uh, since 2018 is the electronic transmission of the papers from the farm, the export papers, the health papers, the health certificate from the farm to the USDA office. So here again, the accredited veterinarian on the farm in the States fills out the papers, electronically transmits it to the central USDA office and uh, they endorse it and could virtually instantaneously transmit it back to the accredited veterinarian and the breeding farm. And of course it would be mothered up with the semen right away and shipped. And so time becomes uh, 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 very short. And so that really uh, isn't a problem anymore. So uh, this is the preferred way now. And uh, as I said, this, this new system um, resolves two big problems, the time problem, where hopefully it's instantaneously transmitted to the USDA, they stamp it, endorse it, and get it back to the farm. So, and the other big thing, which we endure uh, as Canadian breeders is the cost. I know personally, I uh, uh, have paid uh, three and $400 for these uh, papers to be uh, physically transmitted from the farm to the USDA office and back. So uh, it, it creates a major saving for us as Canadian breeders to uh, have this done electronically. So, so you say, well, what's the problem then? Well, the big problem seemed to be that the awareness in this electronic transmission was very poorly advertised or the and so a lot of the American accredited veterinarians were not aware of the process or at least didn't get signed up for the process. So over the last two and we're going into the third year of the US veterinarians not knowing about the process. So they continue doing the hard copy uh, in person transmitting to the uh, USDA office. So. The reason for us wanting Equestrian Canada and me personally too, wanting to talk to Canadians is to make them aware that yes, this process is in place and is definitely the preferred process. And for them to be sure that the, the stud farms or the accredited veterinarians in the US are aware that this is the way they should be doing it. So, um, uh, that's why I'm talking today. And so uh, I would like the Canadian breeders and, uh, and uh, accredited veterinarians to be sure when the, the contracts are signed and the uh, semen is initially arranged to be shipped to be sure that the electronic process is uh, being arranged because the, uh, the process of getting signed up with the electronic uh, process is uh, a little involved and takes time. So you want to be sure that the uh, US veterinarian signs up well before the day that he's actually going to ship the semen. So uh, that's the whole point of this is uh, to have the, the Canadian veterinarians and breeders aware of this system and then to be sure that the American end of the equation is also aware to save us a bunch of money as well as uh, time and jacking around with trying to get papers back and forth. So um, anyhow, that's that's it. Thanks, Bettina. That, that's, th thank you, Wayne. That's a great summary. And it, but it, once again, it's, it's all about planning. 
And uh, to have this work for you seamlessly, you got to make sure that your USDA veterinarian is signed up well in advance. But that's a great way, and that is that's a bit of a game changer uh, for uh, for many breeders uh, to with respect to both uh, affordability and access. Because one of the things Wayne discovered is some of the best the owners of the best stallions refused to ship to Canada at all for any price because it was simply too much trouble. So that's great, and thanks for your work on that. Um, at this point, uh, we will be open for questions. If you have any questions for our speakers, uh, just unmute your microphone in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. Um, and, and Bettina, we have a few in the chat box that maybe I'll just read out. Great, thank you, Christy. Um, so first question, I think this one is for Allison. Uh, hopefully Allison's still on, but I know that we ha also have Wayne and Bettina and maybe they'll be able to answer as well. So uh, it says, hi, so no booster to vaccines a month after if you suspect a horse has had a great vaccination program prior to coming to our stable. Uh, so I guess I... So the question is around boosting a horse that has recently come to a new stable. Is that what I'm getting? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, so. Well, I, I don't see, if, if the horse has had a great program thus far, I don't see why uh, coming to a new stable, they would require a booster necessarily, no. Hmm. Okay, thank you. And the next question is for EC. So I will uh, respond, but it's what considerations and requirements are being made or imposed for venues and show organizers as we approach show season? given the EHV1 outbreaks around the world. Um, so what I will say is that we have um, an EHV1 specific task force that is looking at what our current biosecurity requirements are um, and what an enhanced safety policy could look like for the upcoming show season. Um, I'm not gonna say that we've worked through the details of that, but the obvious is that we, ha we do have new um, vaccination requirements that are mandatory for 2021 that can be found in our general regulations. Uh, so there's the requirement for vaccinations. We're gonna be working both on the requirement side of things, but also heavily on communication and education around good biosecurity and biosecurity practices within the venues. So we will use this call as um, a format to help with communication, but we expect that there will be further communication on what changes are being made, if any, in the 2021 uh, season? Um, Our requirement uh, for vaccination against respiratory diseases at venues um, could not be more timely under the circumstances. Absolutely. Uh, another question, outside of typical biosecurity measures, are there any special considerations for EC officials attending a show and returning to their personal horses? Um, I think, I think I'll give that one to Allison, if Allison or Amy, in terms of um, any additional or special considerations for people returning back to their personal horses after working within a show or competing at a show. It wouldn't be any different uh, change of clothes, shoes, shoes and clothes, and uh, you know, hand sanitizer, of course. But I think the big one is changing the shoes and the clothes for sure. Okay. We're all getting pretty good at washing our hands. <laughs> um, and then we have, oh, how well known is the 21 day moratorium on the movement of horses from barn where there is an outbreak? From barn where there's an outbreak. Uh, how well known? Uh, you mean like, so I'm interpreting this two ways. Like, how do we know it's 21 days or, or how do people know about it? I don't know. So in terms of information on um, when, when the movement restrictions are released, yeah. So in the past, um, they've just been, there hasn't been a notification because they've been voluntary movement restrictions. And this is in Ontario I'm speaking for. Um, so when that 21 days is up, it's done and people move. Um, we, we will probably put it through the, we usually put our communication through the EDCC and CAS, the Canadian Animal Health Surveillance System. So we will likely notify, because this year is special, um, <laughs> we'll likely notify through them when the voluntary movement restrictions are up. 
Um, and in, in terms of why is it 21 days, I don't know if that was really part of the question, but um, that's three virus cycles. So most uh, horses shed between seven and 10 days. Uh, there, in certain situations, we can end a movement restriction at 14 days with testing. So you'd have to test negative um, twice, seven days apart, or we go the extra seven days really for safety to cover the 21 days. So that's why we use 21 days. Thanks, Allison. And one more um, question, and this is from Wayne. So could you comment on the different vaccines from for the abortion form of EHV and the respiratory form? Uh, so the, the vaccines that are used for abortion are more, have a greater immune stimulant property. Now there's some, there's been some longstanding belief that they may be more protective against development neuro disease because they do have a greater uh, immunogenic response. I guess the reality is we, in Ontario anyway, we just haven't used them in outbreaks of neuro disease. Um, and it, partly because we either haven't had a big enough facility where we would vaccinate horses outside of the in-contact horses, so we just don't vaccinate, period. Um, or the ones on the periphery have, have used the respiratory vaccine. Now, the resp respiratory vaccine is good for preventing um, the, for reducing viral shed. So in an outbreak, it can break that spread through a barn. Um, but as I said, the, uh, the abortion vaccines do create a better immune stimulation. And, and that is the thought that it might be more protective against neuro disease. We just haven't had in the field uh, really a test of that. So. Okay, thanks, um, Allison. And then I did see one more. Are there provinces that have legislated movement restrictions? Uh, is Mary still there? What do you mean, Mary? I see your name. <laughs> Uh, are there provinces that have legislated movement restrictions? So in their, legis in their legislation, you mean, Mary, have they put in that time frame, or what do you mean exactly? Where it's not voluntary, where the, oh. where okay. the movement restriction is not voluntary. Well, okay, from Ontario's perspective, we have the ability under the Animal Health Act to put a, a, an order down on a farm where we would, we would restrict movement and it would not be voluntary. Um, we have up to date not had to use it um, in any equine cases and, and in certainly in no herpes cases, but we do have that tool in our toolbox if we do run into uh, problems. Now, at, to that point, the, the people that we've worked with, the farms and the vets have been incredibly easy to work with. Um, and the vets have done a tremendous effort, uh, a tremendous job at managing biosecurity on the farm. So, we have not uh, been concerned and everything has gone smoothly to date. Cause I think people understand, appreciate the seriousness of it, but we do have that in our back pocket if we need to use it. I don't know about other provinces. Uh, hello, it's uh, Terry Whiting from Winnipeg. Um, constitutionally provinces can't prohibit interprovincial movement, but they can quarantine on arrival. We've had this discussion with chronic wasting disease movement in Western Canada, and it's one of our sort of idiosyncratic things we have to deal with in agriculture, because under 64 of the Constitution, agriculture is joint federal provincial, and they don't always divide responsibilities up reasonably. So when we've been dealing with interprovincial movement of cervids for brain worm and um, chronic wasting disease, only the federal government can control interprovincial movement. And they, and they did the eradication of tuberculosis provincially and the eradication of uh, brucellosis was based on a provincial area certification overseen by the federal government. So it's just one of the problems we have in Canada with dual federalism. Thanks, Terry. Um, and then there's one more question here that I think uh, will be partially myself and partially Allison. So we have several large venues in Ontario that host all three disciplines. If contact tracing shows that a positive horse has attended, will an immediate lockdown be done? 
So if you wanna answer that from OMAFRA's perspective in terms of process, um, and then on the EC side, I can give a little bit of context, but it's definitely gonna be more around what is the specific isolation and response plan within that venue. But I'm not sure, Allison, if you wanna provide some insight on what would trigger sort of a, a lockdown on the grounds or isolation on the grounds um, from OMAFRA's standpoint. Well, certainly if we had a, a positive test result, um, we, so we, it, it would depend, it would depend a bit on how the, um, the event was laid out. So again, we would, there would, there would be tracing of that horse, what, what contacts that horse, um, what other horse contacts that horse had, where it had been on the showgrounds. Uh, if it had been in multiple classes and was everywhere, then we we would potentially lock down that that uh, event. Um, again, we need to be able to work with the organizers, and they also have to have very good um, records as to who's where and when. So, what horses are in what stalls at what time? So we can do those tracings. But if it was uh, pretty well limited to a barn, it may only be a barn affected. So it it does depend a bit on on the circumstances. You're muted, Christy. So I don't see uh, any other questions in the chat box. There will be a recording made available. Um, and as mentioned, we do have a task force that has been put together. Both Allison and Amy have been invited to participate in that work, as well as some competition organizers and veterinarians. So we're meeting on a weekly basis at this point, and hopefully we'll have more information flowing out of that group pretty shortly. So thank you very much. And I'll just pass it over to Bettina for your closing remarks. Thank you very much, Christy. That's great. I really, really appreciate you pulling all this together so quickly. I uh, also really want to thank our speakers for taking uh, the time uh, to get us up to speed on what's happening with this whole situation and with the semen importation. And uh, thank you everybody for attending. And we will hopefully see you in three months for our next scheduled call, however, uh, we have the opportunity in the face of uh, uh, emerging infectious disease to call a, a make another call at short notice if we really feel we need to speak to people about the national herd. So that uh, venue is also available to us uh, to reach out again. But thank you everybody for your time and um, have a good day. Thank you, Bettina. Bye, Wayne. Thank you.